Well, I'm sure we'll have some folks filtering in as uh, lunch finishes up and they get through the lines downstairs. But we'll go ahead and get started, um, get into some of the intro stuff right now. Uh, I'm going to talk today about JRuby 9000, which is the new and fast and awesome version of JRuby that we've continued to work on over the years. A uh, bit about me, Charles Nutter. I've worked on JRuby, obviously, for a long time now. Uh, nine years working on it full time at various companies. And we're very thankful to folks like Sun Microsystems, rest in peace, and uh, Engine Yard, and now Red Hat for, for funding our work. Uh, I also worked on a language called Mira, which is basically a, uh, a Ruby syntax for writing Java code. It's not really a Ruby runtime, but uses some of the nice surface level features of Ruby to make Java a little nicer. Uh, and there's a whole suite of projects called JNR, the Java Native Runtime. Makes it really easy to call down to native code, integrate with native libraries. Uh, if you need to do any of that stuff, it's worth checking out. I've also been involved in a lot of OpenJDK level stuff. Uh, I was one of the folks helping the Invoke Dynamic JSR get through, helping make sure it was designed well for languages like JRuby and for future use. Uh, Project Panama, uh, one of the new, one of the new uh, possibilities for Java 10, uh, is going to be native calls built into the JVM. So where we have something like a pinvoke on .NET, we have FFI and Ruby, you'll be able to do something very similar on future versions of Java to call down into na any native library without writing JNI or C code. Uh, and most recently, starting to get involved in Project Valhalla, which is about value types and generic specialization, really cool stuff that'll come along in, in hopefully Java 10 or so. Uh, so a quick note on 9000, where did that come from? Well, so when we decided to start working on the next major version of JRuby after JRuby 1.7, uh, we had a problem, we had an issue. Uh, Ruby itself had a version 1.8, 1.9, 2.0, uh, so it would be a little bit confusing for us to go directly into a 2.0 version or a 1.8, confusing because people wouldn't really know whether it's the JRuby version or the Ruby version. So we kind of just threw this at the wall as a code name and said, let's just take, pick 9000. We'll just go with JRuby 9000 as the name of the project. Uh, and over time, it actually kind of started to, st to stick. We actually had a version number 9000 in JRuby for a while. Uh, lots of obvious Dragon Ball Z references came out of this, and people thought it was kind of fun, fun uh, goofy uh, version number. But it ended up turning out that it was actually going to be our ninth major version of JRuby. Uh, and so ultimately, JRuby 9000 became JRuby 9, uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about here today. So first of all, JRuby from 9000 feet, we'll, we'll not quite go to 10,000 feet here. Uh, it's Ruby on the JVM, obviously. Uh, the current version, JRuby 9.x, uh, supports Ruby 2.2, uh, which is the current version of Ruby. It's the first time we've been completely caught up on compatibility. So everything out there that runs on regular Ruby, regular C Ruby, you should be pretty confident it's going to work on JRuby as well. We do still, still support our 1.7 branch, uh, which supports older versions like Ruby 1.8 and 1.9. Uh, we have a fairly business-friendly license in the Eclipse public license. Uh, if you want something more copyleft-like, we do also uh, have GPL and LGPL, and all of our contributors have agreed to that. Uh, and probably the, the coolest thing about JRuby, as compared to regular Ruby, is that it really integrates well with the Java platform. You can call Java libraries, you get the benefit of Java threads, Java GC, but all of the cool stuff that the Ruby community has. And I hope to show some of that for you today. So now, first of all, uh, there are some folks in here, but Ruby is kind of an unusual customer, an unusual guest to have at a Java conference. Uh, Ruby folks have their own conferences that they go to. So I think the Java community's kind of lost track of uh, some of these off-platform languages like Ruby. Not really sure that there's people actually using Ruby out there. So I want to talk through just a few little details, uh, dispel some myths about where Ruby stands these days. Uh, the Ruby community is very strong right now. Uh, there's hundreds, thousands of people working out there on, on individual projects, probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of contributors and, and, and users of the language. Uh, I think that this vibrant community, this big community that's behind Ruby is really as important as the, the, or the language and the libraries are. This is what keeps the community going. This is what makes it possible to have 36,000 subscribers on the Ruby talk mailing list, the main mailing list. Uh, RubyGems.org, which is kind of like our Maven Central, well, almost 7,000 libraries, and <coughs> in the past uh, six years or so, uh, six billion, more, more than six billion downloads of all those libraries. That's something like 24 downloads every second for six years. This is a big community doing a lot of cool stuff and working really hard on making Ruby better. 
Uh, and there's hundreds of conferences. The reason you don't see Ruby people here very often is because they've got their own events to go to. They've got their own conferences. Even if they're using JRuby, you're probably going to see them at one of the hundreds of Ruby events. Uh, lots of books out there, lots of user groups. It's an entire world unto itself, and it has a very uh, rich set of users. Uh, one of the metrics that folks use out there to measure this is a, something called the Tyobi Language Index. Uh, this is, you know, perhaps a little bit questionable uh, metrics, but they use things like job postings, uh, search indexes, how much, how much search uh, volume there is for a given language, uh, questions on Stack Overflow, repositories in GitHub, things along those lines, and pr pr provide sort of an aggregate score for the different languages. Um, and based on the most recent one from uh, just this past month, Ruby is probably the ninth language as far as those metrics are concerned. Uh, it had dipped a little bit over the past couple years, and other languages jumped up into the, top, into the top 10. But now back into the top 10, up at 9, and the little double up green thingies there indicates that it's growing pretty quickly compared to last year. Uh, the other languages on the JVM, other than Java, don't really even register on this. I think Scala was at like uh, 28th on the list, somewhere below Logo. Um, and uh, Groovy was down below uh, uh, languages like Scratch, which is the kid's language for doing uh, education. So the other JVM languages are great, and, I, and we are all friends, and you know, we're, we're good buddies, but Ruby is, is definitely a big deal as far as languages go. Um, another metric here, actually uh, measuring job postings on Indeed.com. Uh, they have this uh, search tool you can go and check for uh, number of uh, job postings at any given time, over time, and, and relative, and, and uh, growth and shrinking within the community. And Ruby obviously sh is much higher than, than any of the other JVM languages, of course, save for Java. Java puts us all into the ground. Uh, but even Rails, even though it hasn't been in the headlines and isn't the new hotness anymore, still considerably more people out there doing Rails jobs and Rails work than all of the other JVM languages combined. Uh, the last one I'm going to look at here is GitHub. Uh, it's not a typo. This is a site that basically uses number of GitHub repositories and GitHub activity to rate different languages based on how active they are, how many projects are being done in those languages. Uh, and by their metric, Ruby is in about sixth place. And actually, if you remove CSS as being a programming language, uh, more like uh, fifth place. So in the top five of programming languages for all repositories on GitHub. And then, of course, I have to poke fun at my JVM language friends. And they're, they're here, but they're down towards the bottom. Uh, you know, Scala is actually doing fairly well on most of these metrics compared to the rest of the JVM languages. It's kind of interesting to see that MATLAB is more, more popular than Groovy and so on. Haskell. People actually use Haskell, I guess. So that's kind of cool. Uh, now, getting a little bit more away from poking fun at my other JVM language friends, uh, some actual community contributions that have grown out of the Ruby community. Uh, is anybody here using SAS to do uh, style sheets, CSS? There's a few folks. So SAS is uh, an external DSL, a little language that grew out of the Ruby community. Uh, it's uh, basically a, a DSL for doing CSS, but having better features, better syntax, easier managed code for, for actually generating it. So on the left here, we have a little piece of SAS code, uh, and on the right, the CSS that it generates. And we have things that we don't you normally get in CSS, like variables, uh, like having uh, indentation be the way we break up certain areas rather than having uh, open and close braces, and so on. So a, t a different take on doing CSS that's now grown out of the Ruby community and is, is more generally used. Uh, Cucumber is another one. Anybody doing Cucumber testing? OK, there's a few folks. So Cucumber, again, is another external DSL that grew up in the Ruby community. Uh, it's story-based testing. Rather than writing a piece of code that exercises some, some library or unit test or an integration test, you write stories about what you expect your application to do. Uh, and you express it in a mostly natural language. Here's an example from the Cucumber site. So we've gotten a, a scenario, and we're going to call it eating. Uh, given that there are start number of cucumbers, when I eat a certain number of those cucumbers, then I should have a certain number of cucumbers left. And then a table of possible examples to run through to make sure that different scenarios behave the way they're supposed to. Uh, this grew out of the RSpec community, behavior-driven development and stuff, but it, with a desire for something you could give QA engineers, uh, user acceptance engineers, a language that they would be able to write rather than writing code. And this is an executable test, essentially, that will exercise your code and make sure it's working properly. 
Uh, the last little example I wanted to talk about is ASCII Doctor. Uh, ASCII Doctor is basically a text processing library that turns ASCII doc format into HTML5, into docbook, into several other formats. Uh, it's written in Ruby, it's a Ruby gem, but you're able to use it on the JVM and with Java projects due to the magic of JRuby. And you may never even know that you're using JRuby under the cover. Uh, and there's a quick example of what ASCII doc looks like, uh, sort of a similar to a markdown sort of uh, format. So now these are, these are all Ruby projects, but what about the JRuby community? What does that actually look like? Uh, now the JRuby community kind of gets folded into the Ruby community when we measure metrics, when we look for people using us. Uh, just about everybody in the Ruby community is doing something with JRuby. Uh, but last year for RubyConf, we actually asked people, let us know if you've got a project that you're running on JRuby, send us a logo. And the response we got was way beyond what we expected. We thought we might get a couple dozen logos and put them on a slide and be you know, able to show that there's some folks using it. But there's, there's some serious customers here. Uh, BBC News, for example, all of the election results that they publish on the web are a JRuby-based application. So the Scottish referendum, uh, uh, the recent elections that were there, all of that stuff going through JRuby. Uh, Visa has a number of sites running on JRuby as well. IBM has projects that they ship as part of commercial packages. Uh, in the US, uh, the uh, Bank Simple, uh, Square, that has easy credit card accepting. So many different companies that are doing JRuby, even if you're not developing with JRuby yourself, there's a very good chance that you've probably used it indirectly at some point. Uh, and this is just a small sampling. This was a day's worth of gathering to find these companies and get a list of them. All right, so let's get into some real technical nitty gritty. Hopefully you're interested and you're excited about where Ruby's going and where JRuby's going. Uh, we'll talk about Ruby and give you a little quick tour here. Uh, so here we've got an example. We've got Java on the left side and Ruby on the right. And we're just going to walk through what the differences are. Obviously, the syntax is not Java. It's a little different. But generally, there's only a few small changes uh, that you need to mentally do to convert Java into Ruby code. Uh, so first of all, obviously, this is a, a class definition here. Uh, and you see up at the top, one of the differences is that for extending a class, Ruby uses a less than sign rather than the word extends. Uh, just a simple Ruby shortcut there. Uh, pretty easy to get used to that sort of thing. Uh, now, as far as constructors go, on Java side, we always have the constructor named the same as the class. Uh, and this can also be somewhat limiting. It's hard to create factory methods that have different ways of creating those, unless you build another class or you've got some static methods somewhere. Uh, in Ruby, the constructor is always called initialize. And when you construct it, you're basically calling new on the class. So you can have new that just does the normal initialize. You can have your own version of new. There's a factory method that creates other, other uh, related uh, structures to go with it. Uh, everything being kind of object oriented here. This is calling a method on a class that just happens to be called new. New calls initialize and we have our object. Um, of course, you'll notice that uh, on the Java side, we have our type declarations that disappear on the Ruby side. Ruby is 100% dynamically typed language. Uh, and in the Ruby world, this is referred to as duck typing. So the idea with duck typing is that all you really care about is whether a target object can respond to some method. You're not really concerned about its concrete type or whether it's in a particular class hierarchy. So we've got some object and we're calling swim on it. Well, if it's a duck and we call swim on a duck, it's fine. It walks like a duck, it quacks like, quacks like a duck, it swims like a duck, it's no problem. Uh, now where it gets a little scary is what if some other object gets in there? So here we're trying to make an anchor swim. We call a swim on an anchor object. Uh, and that's where people tend to get a little scared of the whole duck typing and dynamic typing thing. Uh, anchors can't swim. At runtime, we're going to get a no method error. It's going to say we don't know how to do this behavior. Uh, now, as scary as this seems, it's really not a whole lot different than typecasting in Java, casting from one type to another, uh, which you'll often run into bad objects that will sneak in, don't implement an interface, and, and will cause a runtime error for you. Uh, and in the vast majority of cases, testing, we all write tests, of course, and testing eliminates most of these issues. For, so for real production applications, it, it almost never happens that you actually get no method errors in production. No more than you would get class cast exceptions or null pointer exceptions in Java, which we all have run into constantly in production applications. Uh, so generally, this is rarely an issue for Ruby applications, and it's not something that should uh, turn you off of trying to play with Ruby. 
Uh, instance variables in, J in Ruby always have an at sigil on the front of it, uh, rather than doing this dot value or just accessing the value directly. All instance variable accesses have an at. Uh, actually a very nice feature because you never are confused whether you're working with a local variable or you're working with an instance variable in the class. It's very clear from the code and it's actually shorter than the, uh, the long version on the Java side, this dot. Ruby has a very rich support for metaprogramming and one of the simpler features there is being able to define attribute methods. So on the left we have to manually write out get radius, say that we want to return the radius, and we have to do this a hundred times in all of our applications, in all of our POJO objects. Uh, whereas on the right, in Ruby, we just say that we want an attribute with this name. In this case, it's a read-only attribute, so we want an attribute, attribute, attribute reader for radius. And it's done. The rest is all generated for us behind the scenes. Uh, another nice shortcut in Ruby, uh, the last expression in any method is the return value of the method. You don't need to explicitly return uh, for simple methods that have only one line. Just let the value fall off and that becomes the return value. Uh, you can actually return explicitly if you want, so do an early return, but a lot of Ruby code kind of just does its computation and then lets the last value fall out as the return. Uh, of course, Ruby has closures. Uh, had closures before most of the other JVM languages were even around. Now we have these as Java 8 lambdas, thanks, thank goodness, uh, and it actually integrates pretty well with it. But you can see here we're grouping letters by a postal code. Uh, so passing in a lambda or closure, iterating all of those uh, letters and, and sorting them by, or grouping them by that postcode. Uh, down at the bottom is some of the Java integration magic. We've got a Java button, a swing button. Uh, we do action performed and pass it a lambda, pass it a closure. And that will actually then be the body of the uh, action listener uh, implementation, done magically behind the scenes for you by JRuby. Uh, on the right, some more complicated examples. We've got an implementation of my open for a file. Uh, it opens the file passes it back out to the closure or the block, and then makes sure it's closed. Uh, so a lot of that boilerplate code that we've had to add Java features for, like uh, try with resources and whatnot, uh, you could have just implemented yourself if you're using Ruby. Another nice little feature of Ruby is uh, mix-in inheritance. Uh, modules are part of the language. Basically a bag of methods that you can include into hierarchies. Uh, so in this case, we've got my tree implementation. Uh, it's going to include enumerable. And the only thing it needs to do to include enumerable and have a bunch of uh, enumerating features like grouping and mapping and sorting and selecting and whatnot is to implement each just to uh, provide one method that shows how to walk all the elements in this tree. Uh, we mix in enumerable, partial uh, implementation there on the right, and we get all those for free. So you don't have to necessarily extend from an enumerable class or from a list class. You can just mix in those behaviors and they'll work as if they're part of your class hierarchy from the beginning. Uh, I mentioned metaprogramming a little bit. Here's a little bit more advanced example. Uh, we've got a hash of uh, three different colors, red, green, and blue values. Uh, we're going to iterate over each of these colors and then define a method for each one. Uh, through the magic of Ruby, we create these methods, they have the values in place, and now we've actually generated our code rather than writing that code by hand. And a lot of the Ruby libraries out there make great use of this, especially, for example, Rails. And we'll talk a little bit about Rails later too. Uh, almost done with a quick tour here. Uh, Ruby has an open type system, or an open class system. So classes can be reopened and modified later on. Generally, this is done to mix in a new module, uh, to add a method, like a debug method in this case, uh, or in very rare cases, to patch a method that isn't behaving properly in someone's library, what they call monkey patching. Uh, it's a discouraged thing, but it's nice that you're able to do this. You can actually take a class, make your modifications to it, and spread it across multiple files, not have one giant file every time you're working with it. Uh, and the last little piece here, Ruby is an object-oriented, pure object-oriented language. Everything is an object. Uh, so of course we have class is, a class is an object and can have class methods, similar to static methods. Uh, but even numbers are objects as well. And we can call 2s uh, to turn uh, the value 12 into a, a, uh, a base 16 hexadecimal string. Uh, or we can check whether 11 is odd or even. Uh, these methods all exist on these objects, and you can call them like they're just any other object in the system. All right, so how do we get started with JRuby? 
Uh, for folks on Windows, uh, we generally recommend the Windows installer we have. Uh, it'll put JRuby in the right places for you, set up path and environments, uh, and uh, give you a, a little JRuby shell that you can start up uh, with nice interactive features so you can play with the language. Uh, on other platforms, you can certainly go back to old school tarballs. Uh, many of the Linux and BSDs have JRuby packages. As those packages often are, they may be a little bit behind, but they're usually out there. Uh, or you can just unpack your own tarball and put the bin directory in your path and you're ready to go. Uh, it's a complete uh, distribution all set to go for you. Uh, if you get a little bit more into the Ruby world, Ru most Rubyists are uh, fans of Ruby version switchers, Ruby switching tools. Uh, and the most popular is Ruby version manager, RVM. Uh, you can go to rvm.io, run a little line of bash code, and then you get a full set of environment commands that let you switch between JRuby, CRuby, and update and, and do versions uh, all on your own without the packaging system of whatever platform you're on. It's just installed locally in your home directory. Uh, now, of course, in the Java world, everything needs to be in Maven, so we have all of our packages in Maven. Uh, and we actually have, uh, at the top there, our tarballs are also distributed as Maven artifacts, so another place that you can go and get them if you're living in more of a Maven world. Uh, but various different forms of JRuby, the base JRuby jar itself, JRuby with all the Ruby standard libraries, and so on. Uh, so now, a lot of people ask, why don't we just have a JRuby jar? Why isn't it just a jar that we distribute? Uh, well, it, it, JRuby is really not just a language. Like Ruby itself, this is an entire platform. Uh, there's many tools that come along with it. Uh, Gem for installing uh, Ruby gems, our, our Maven packages, essentially. Uh, IRB for interactive consoles. Rake for doing builds. Uh, all of this stuff is in the box with JRuby, and when you unpack it, you get an entire JRuby environment that you can run with. Uh, so having just a jar doesn't allow us to ship the tools as nicely and certainly doesn't allow us to support Ruby's command line features, nice interactivity, and so on. Uh, I mentioned earlier that JRuby has really good uh, integration with Java. That should probably go without saying since we're on the JVM. Uh, but it really is simple and clean to take Ruby code and wrap up a Java library and call it and script it. Uh, very simple code, very clean, and actually a lot more fun than writing it in Java. Usually if I want to play with a new library, I will load it up into a Ruby script or into the interactive Ruby shell, play with it there for a while, and get to know the library interactively. Uh, quick example of this with Swing. So we've got our imports at the top. We're importing some classes from Java, uh, JFrame and JOption pane. Uh, we're going to construct a frame, and notice it's frame jframe.new, just like a standard Ruby constructor call, jframe.new. Uh, you can also use the full long package form, just like you can in Java. So we create a J button as well. Uh, and then we'll use that closure form uh, with add action listener to give some behavior to the button. It's going to pop up uh, a message dialog uh, with some HTML content in it. Uh, the EOS here is what's called a here doc, a multi-line string. Ruby has a for, uh, support for a number of different multi-line strings. Again, something that we've wanted to have in Java but hasn't quite come along yet. Uh, and then we're going to basically append the button into the frame's content pane. A little bit of JRuby magic. We know that there's a get content pane, so we have a, con we have a simple content pane attribute accessor for it. Uh, we know that it's a list-like structure, so we can append to it. Button goes onto the content pane. Uh, default close operation here is uh, obviously set default close operation. We turn it into an attribute assignment. Uh, we do pack and we do set visible with visible equals true. So a lot of the things that you would normally stumble over in a Java program or have to type twice as long to get are very clean and simple in JRuby. Uh, looking at this code, you wouldn't necessarily even know that you're working with Java libraries, except for the fact that there's Java X at the, uh, at the top. Uh, the rest of it looks like it's normal Ruby code in normal Ruby classes. So that's the uh, calling Java from Ruby side. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about embedding Ruby, uh, pulling Ruby into uh, an existing Java application. Uh, and if a more fun example, more entertaining example here is Prugin. So my uh, co-lead on the project, Tom Enabo, uh, is a big Minecrafter, and he, wor he wrote this package called Prugin. So any Minecrafters here? There's got to be some around, right? There's a couple. Uh, and the, I know the DevOps for Kids and the Java One for Kids stuff, they do a lot of Minecraft stuff too. 
Uh, and honestly, I think it'd be nicer for them to use Ruby for a lot of it. But I'll show you in a minute here. So the structure of Minecraft here, we've got the JVM, we've got Minecraft in, in the form of Spigot, which is the pluggable, uh, scriptable version of Minecraft available for users to do plugins. And then plugins generally written in Java just above that. So with Prugin, Prugin is its own little Java plugin that plugs into Minecraft, and it knows how to load Ruby plugins and has a nice Ruby language and Ruby DSL. So the, the Minecraft, Minecraft server loads Spigot, loads Prugin, and then Prugin goes and grabs your Ruby code and runs it as Ruby scripts. Uh, and then for uh, an entertaining example here, this is uh, Egg Madness, an example plugin that Tom has. Uh, so normally when you drop an egg, you get one chicken or maybe a couple chickens. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Uh, but he's written a plugin here that modifies the chicken egg so that every time you throw it, it creates 100 chickens. Uh, and obviously this starts to get madness very quickly. Uh, as Tom is fond of saying, this is a great way to destroy your Minecraft server. Just start throwing a bunch of 100 egg chickens or, or 100 chicken eggs around. Uh, and this is essentially all the code that's required for that plugin. Uh, certainly less than you would have if you were going to write the plugin in Java. Uh, and all you have to do is put this in the Minecraft Spigot directory with plugin around, plugin's jar, and you can write plugins like this. Uh, so we include plugin plugin, the, uh, the module that sets it up as a plugin. Uh, we set it a little description and a version number for it. And then for on enable, when this plugin is activated by Prugin, uh, we do, uh, for the player egg throw event, we want to modify that behavior. So for that event, we want to say it's always going to hatch. We want the number of egg hatches to be 100 every time. Uh, and we want the, uh, the hatching to still be chickens. We'll leave that the same. But obviously, we could put other types here. You could throw a chicken egg and have uh, 100 wolves pop out of it. Uh, the embedding side is actually not that complicated either. So this is the core code in Prugin that loads up the Ruby stuff. Uh, up at the top here, we get a, Ruby, a JRuby scripting container. And uh, now you can use JavaX scripting, uh, but our scripting API is a little bit more Ruby friendly, uh, a little bit less throw the code over the wall like the JavaX stuff. So we create our scripting container up at the top. Uh, we're going to run a little Ruby script to boot things. Uh, this is loading the core of Prugin, which is essentially written all in Ruby except for this little bootstrapper. Uh, down here on the, the core brains class of Prugin, we're going to call new, uh, pass in the, sp the spigot plugin loader and the path for the uh, Minecraft installation. Uh, and then we implement the spigot plugin uh, methods to basically just call the Ruby plugin methods. So Java's on enable calls the Ruby on enable and so on. Uh, within Prugin, here is the on enable. It just walks through all the plugins that you've got in your plugin directory. Uh, for each one of those, it tells the plugin manager to enable it. And that's it. All you have then is a few lines of Ruby code and you can plug in and script pretty much every aspect of Minecraft. Okay, so another area that Ruby has excelled in creating a, a, a wide variety of options is build tools. Uh, I'm gonna talk through a few examples here, first from the Ruby perspective, and then getting more over to the Java side. So Rake is the standard build tool in the Ruby world, most popular build tool for Ruby. There are a few others, but this one's kind of one out for most things. Uh, Rake obviously modeled after make, uh, but it's still mostly imperative. Uh, the structure is similar, but it's just essentially a Ruby script with a little bit of dependency logic in it. Uh, it actually works great for JRuby or Java projects as well. Uh, we use Rake for parts of JRuby's build, specifically running our test suites to make sure that JRuby is still compatible with regular Ruby. Uh, here is a very simple Rake script. Uh, so we've got a task default that's going to depend on build. Uh, the build task has a description. It depends on compile, defined somewhere else in the file. Uh, and then in with the, within this do end, within this closure, you can have any, any Ruby code you like. Uh, it'll go out and build the code, it'll fetch dependencies, whatever else is necessary. Uh, down at the bottom, we just basically alias the build to jar. So we can also do rake jar, have the same effect. So fairly simple. Uh, a little bit more complicated example here. Uh, now within our clean task, we have regular Ruby code. We have a file list that includes certain directories and certain files. Uh, those are the ones we're going to delete. So that's our file list, 
down at the bottom for each of those files, RM, RF, uh, a default uh, uh, feature of, of the core uh, Ruby stuff in the, in the rake library. RM, RF those files and print them out as we go. Uh, simple Ruby code and we've got our, our clean task. Uh, now, most of you I don't expect are going to immediately start using Rake to do builds. We've got our own uh, Java ecosystem. Uh, so we'll talk through Maven as the next example. Uh, so problems with Maven. Obviously, it's terribly verbose. Um, I've asked some of the Maven folks why in the world they never used attributes, why it has to be tags for everything. Uh, it drives me nuts. Uh, it's also pretty much 100% declarative. You can't really do imperative loops or, or uh, uh, branching logic in there unless it's wired into the Maven lifecycle. Uh, very difficult to do more imperative code as part of a Maven uh, build. Uh, and probably the, the, the most damning part is that there's a very weak set of default conventions. Uh, there is the general layout of your project, there is how that's supposed to be built, but if you ever need to uh, expand on that, have a, a larger project structure, have multiple sub-modules, then it starts to get really messy really quickly. Uh, so to improve upon this, uh, there's a, a new project that's coming around and it's actually released in Maven 3.3.1 and higher called Maven Polyglot. So the idea behind Maven Polyglot is that maybe we can address that non-imperative, verbose XML structure of a POM file uh, by allowing you to use whatever language you're comfortable with. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about Ruby, but there's JavaScript, there's Groovy, uh, there's actually a new uh, a Maven Polyglot XML form that does use attributes to try and reduce some of the verbosity. Uh, but they all still fit into the same model and they all still generate the same project structure. Uh, so our JRuby build actually is entirely based on this Ruby polyglot Maven support. And I wanted to walk through a few examples of what the build script looks like to show why it's so much nicer than using pom.xml. Um, so first off, I can't even, couldn't even fit the whole thing on the slide if I stretched it out. Uh, but we've got our basic Maven pom file here. Uh, all we're trying to do is set up the basics of the project, some dependencies, uh, group ID and version number and so on. Uh, now if you put this into the Maven polyglot format, it becomes a lot cleaner. So this is the Ruby version. The Groovy version would be similar, I imagine. The JavaScript ver version would be similar. Uh, so I've got our demo app project. We've got whatever site it's supposed to be on. Uh, we're using some particular model version for this. Uh, here, in a single line, we can de define our group ID, artifact ID, and version number that goes with it. This is a jar package. Uh, and then we've got a jar dependency that goes along with it. So already significantly cleaner than a pom.xml, and this will just run directly with Maven 331. Uh, another example here, uh, I, yeah, so just doing the group, artif group and artifact ID, uh, here it is again in the JRuby stuff. Uh, and now the interesting bit here is we're actually using a bit of Ruby code at the top to read from a global version file. Uh, rather than having to update every POM file when we make a change to the version number, we just have a little bit of Ruby code that runs imperatively before the Maven model is built and gets the right version number for you. Uh, most Maven projects will have some number of properties built into them for various things. Uh, again, those are much simpler, much cleaner in a Ruby format. Here's our properties mapping A to B. Uh, this one's always my favorite, the long strings of dependencies and all these extra XML tags, uh, again, boiled down to just a single line for each one. Certainly a lot cleaner. Uh, and nobody wants to look at this. No one wants to look at this. This is clean. It's very easy to understand. It's which library, in which group, and there's the version numbers. Uh, a plugin that's actually pulled in here, and this is for uh, shading JRuby. So we have a super jar, an uber jar with all our dependencies. Uh, it shrinks down. It's still complicated. There's a lot of, lot of attributes that are being done here, but it's certainly a lot cleaner and easier to read than that giant blob of XML that no one should ever have to look at. Uh, and again, just using standard Ruby syntax and Ruby features here. Uh, so overall, the JRuby build, uh, we do still have a pom.xml for uh, IDEs and environments that don't recognize the Maven polyglot stuff, uh, but probably about a third as many lines of code for our build script, uh, and about half as many characters. Uh, and that's just less for us to maintain, less, less visual noise when we do we need to make changes to the build. And it's much more approachable for folks coming outside, from outside the project. Uh, so how do you use this? 
uh, there is still a bit of magic XML in there. If you have a .mvn directory, you add a .mvn directory to your project, stick this extensions XML in here, and then say which Maven extensions you want to use. In this case, we're using the Polyglot Ruby extension, which will make Maven then go look for a pom.rb before it looks for a pom XML. Uh, to generate that POM RB, there's actually uh, a goal out there as part of the Polyglot project that will take an existing POM XML and produce the POM.RBs that you saw earlier. Uh, so you don't even have to go and rewrite this all by hand. You can take any Maven project, convert its Maven build, its POM XML, into whatever language you're more comfortable with. And it will continue to work exactly the same. Uh, now, I mentioned this is Maven 3.3.1, which is not quite propagated out to all of the uh, Linux distributions and so on yet. Uh, Maven Wrapper is another part of this, this project work. Uh, provides an MVNW, sort of like a Gradle W command, that will go and fetch Maven 3.3.1 if it's not available, and then do the build from then on. So you can easily start migrating to the polyglot stuff and get rid of the nasty XML files you might have. Uh, now, speaking of Gradle, we do also have some integrated support for uh, uh, JRuby projects, JRuby code in Gradle itself. Uh, so we've got plugins for doing building, testing, packaging, and so on, running Ruby code. Uh, the idea basically being that we would like JRuby to fit in as a seamless part of a Gradle build. So how many folks are doing Maven as your primary build? How about Gradle? OK, so uh, it's kind of similar, kind of similar. Uh, but yeah, so we're trying to support both of these. We kind of have stuck to Maven just because that's where we came from. Uh, so the base configuration, uh, this plugin is available out there. Apply plugin, uh, com, GitHub, JRuby, Gradle, base, uh, and you'll get the plugin that you need to do all this stuff. Uh, you can execute some Ruby. So here we have a, a JRuby exec that we're pulling in. We have our JRuby exec block, and then specify a script to execute, some arguments to pass it, uh, and it'll run as part of the, 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 the Gradle build. Uh, for uh, a, a full-on project that you've got in Gradle, we can specify Ruby dependencies alongside Java dependencies. So here we've got some gems that are coming uh, from the Ruby gems source. Uh, we've got a Sinatra gem, which I'll talk about later, a little microserver, version 1.4.5. Uh, alternately, you can use this colon syntax, similar to uh, a, uh, uh, the Maven polyglot version of group ID and artifact ID. Um, and then you can also have pre-release gems that are out there. And these are all proxied to uh, look like they're Maven artifacts. Uh, of course, you can tell it to build a, a, your JRuby application with all of your Ruby code and spit out a WAR file or spit out a jar. Uh, in this case, we're creating a jar file. It's going to pull in some of the basic default gems for JRuby, uh, pull in our Ruby code, and produce a simple, runnable, executable that has all of JRuby and the Ruby code ready to go, plus any Java uh, dependencies that you might be using. Uh, I mentioned war files. Here's the example for that. JRuby war. Here's our WebInt stuff. Uh, and again, simple code. It fits right into Gradle. You can start using JRuby as part of a larger application very easily. OK, so that's building stuff uh, using JRuby or with JRuby in mind. Uh, you can also do some really nice testing with Ruby. And this is actually an area I recommend folks if they want to try and get JRuby into the back door or into a, into a company. Uh, a good place to start would be writing tests in Ruby. Uh, so here we have our little contrived Java class. Uh, just adds hello comma to the front of whatever string is passed in. Uh, here is uh, RSpec, like I mentioned before, behavior-driven development. Uh, RSpec is one of the more popular testing frameworks used in the Ruby world. Uh, we'll walk through this. So require spec helper basically pulls in any library dependencies that we need. Uh, Java import, we've got our org JRuby demo hello library we're working with. Uh, so then we basically we're building a specification for this class. So describe hello library add hello. And for that, for this, this example that we're building, uh, let the library value be a new, ver new instance of that hello library. So now anytime we see library, it's going to be a hello library instances or instance in the system. And then we specify various specification lines here. So it prepends hello comma to the given string. It handles null values. And you build up a whole list of specifications here that have clear uh, descriptions of what that behavior is you're looking for. Uh, you can run this later. To it, it'll run the tests. But it'll also spit out an entire specification document that shows which things passed, which things didn't, and what was supposed to happen in each of those cases. Uh, here is a polyglot Maven uh, version of a build script that actually pulls in uh, RSpec 
uh, the gem line there, uh, second chunk from the bottom. Uh, Ruby gems are spec. Uh, and we want this to run as part of the scope, uh, the, the test scope in our Maven build. Uh, and then the RSpec Maven plugin pulls in the necessary bits of JRuby to run the Ruby tests against your Java stuff. Sets up class paths, pulls in the right libraries, and you can use Ruby to do testing as part of a, a standard Java build. Um, here's a little output from that. Basically, as part of the same Maven build, we get our RSpec running. Okay, so those, that's interesting, like not really production stuff, uh, development time work that you might want to do with JRuby. Uh, obviously, the big win for Ruby has been web applications, uh, and specifically Rails. Lots of folks doing Rails applications. Rails is what made Ruby into an uh, international powerhouse. Uh, so Rails is really the original full stack framework. It provided all of MVC, it provided a database layer, uh, provided a simple server out of the box, and a bunch of code generation. So you get a, you get a very quick, quickly, you get a, an application up and running, you can start making modifications to it, and start working with it from day one. Uh, it also brought in this idea of convention over configuration, that in, in general, the standard conventions, the ones that aren't defined, the, the configuration you don't write, should be the, a good default. Pick a good default for everything, rather than making people configure everything every single time they make a new application. And Rails has really kind of changed the face of web development uh, on the JVM as well. Uh, most of the web frameworks that we use today on the JVM are copying, or the, the, the newer web frameworks on the JVM have copied Rails in some way or another, uh, trying to duplicate this convention over configuration, the ability to generate an entire project or generate pieces of it. Uh, and honestly, Rails is still probably the best way to build web applications quickly. If you want to get something up and going in production, you want to be able to un iterate on it fast, Rails is a great way to go. Uh, so the Rails way, you generate an application, it gives you a full structure, and Rails originated this uh, general structure which has been copied by a lot of other projects. Uh, we've got our uh, a gem file, I'll talk about a little bit later, specifies your dependencies. We've got our app directory with all of our MVC stuff, plus some helpers and views and whatnot. Uh, we've got our database directory that has database scripts for rolling forward, rolling back, uh, logging, testing. This is an entire application that it generates right out of the first command. Everything that you need to get it running, and essentially almost everything you need to put it in production is part of that first command you execute. Uh, and in fact, you can just run this directly, start this application up, and have a basic welcome page, and start making your modifications right away. Uh, a little bit deeper into the structure here, uh, we've got something called a migration that gets generated. This is for rolling the database forward and backward. Uh, we've got the models are generated. Uh, in this case, we're scaffolding a person that we're going to be doing all of the CRUD operations on. So we have a person model generated under app models person. Uh, we've got a controller that does all of the CRUD operations and actually manages that. Uh, we've got some views generated for the different pages, for viewing all of the, the people in the system, uh, for uh, showing an individual person, for editing an individual person. And it also will generate some stub tests for you. So you can have it generate all of the different pieces of a, piece of, uh, of a, uh, a CRUD operation or a model, and it will also say, here's some tests, here's what you need to be writing, fill in the blanks and you can do the rest of it yourself. So I'm not going to go into Rails any more than that, because tomorrow, uh, Joe Kuttner, a friend of, our, uh, a friend of the project, uh, and Heroku JVM language owner, uh, is going to be covering uh, Rails along with three other JVM web frameworks, and kind of walking through the structure of them, how they're similar and how they're different. And he'll do a much better treatment of Rails than I will, so make sure you get to that one tomorrow in room 7 uh, at 1750. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about micro frameworks, micro services. Uh, since this seems to be the big hotness now, um, it's actually kind of the big hotness in Ruby several years ago. Uh, there's several different micro frameworks and a whole bunch of little command line servers designed for doing little micro frameworks and micro applications. Uh, so some background here, Rack is essentially the equivalent of Servlet API, it's Ruby's version of Servlet API, uh, and rather than having an, a web XML, you've got a config.ru, uh, Rack up is that RU abbreviation. That starts up the application, does all the config, and boots the rest of your application for you. So you'll see that in some of the upcoming slides. Uh, the, the, the main web micro framework I'm going to talk about here is Sinatra. Uh, very tiny, very small framework, very quick uh, for getting very simple 
services up. So there's folks who write little JSON endpoints uh, using Sinatra. There's folks who will do even larger applications uh, in little pieces. Uh, very lightweight and very fast. Uh, the request cycle is considerably faster than a full stack framework like Rails or Grails. Uh, and you can put in only what you need as part of your application. So here is the hello world script for Sinatra. Uh, we say that we're going to use the Sinatra library. And for a get to slash hi on our URL, uh, return hello world. Uh, and in this case, it's just a plain string, so it'll come back as plain text. We have a web application all set to go. And it literally is just this. We gem install Sinatra to make sure we've got the library installed, but then we can run this script directly, and it will start up a server and be a Ruby endpoint right away. Easy to see how you can start to put services together extremely quickly with just a small amount of code. Uh, pull in the libraries you need and put it in your config RU or your Sinatra script. Um, I mentioned gem files earlier. Uh, Bundler is uh, Ruby's equivalent of Maven dependency management. Uh, you get a gem file that lists all of the dependencies you have, what their versions are, uh, a little bit of extra configuration if you want different dependencies in test versus uh, production or uh, your development environment. Um, you can actually specify which version of Ruby or JRuby you want for your project. So it'll validate all that, make sure it pulls down the dependencies, and get them ready for you. Uh, gem file, uh, here's an example of a gem file that's actually generated for Rails. Uh, so we're saying that we want all of our gems to come from rubygems.org. You can have other repositories. This is the standard one, essentially our Maven Central. Uh, we're going to use Ra Rails 4.2.4 and so on. On all of the dependencies that it sticks in here, then get installed if you do a bundle install. It's going to pull in rake, it's going to pull in JSON, uh, testing frameworks, and so on. All this stuff basically uh, just doing the dependency logic that you'd see in Maven. Uh, so another one that I'm going to talk about, a little server that we actually worked on at, uh, at uh, uh, Red Hat as part of the Polyglot group, uh, Torquebox, which is a set of Ruby wrappers and utilities around uh, JBoss, or now Wildfly. Uh, it's out there as just a standard Ruby gem, but it allows you to use all the same Java EE services that you expect as just another part of your Ruby application. So within your Sinatra script, you can say, I want to set up a messaging endpoint. I want to set up a time job. Don't have to deploy an entire WAR file to do it. All you do is pull in some Torquebox libraries, start up the server, and you're ready to go. Uh, here's an example gem file where we're pulling in the Torquebox web, which is just the web serving component here. Uh, we've got our Sinatra. And then on the other side, the config RU, that rack file that specifies, here's our get logic for Sinatra. Here's how we run the application. Run with Torquebox, and we're actually using a Java EE quality web server to distribute a Ruby Sinatra app. Pretty cool. And now, of course, these are going to be thrown into any application server. You can create a Sinatra app, you can create your little microservice, uh, and then run with Warbler, uh, another project from the JRuby family, that turns it into a plain old WAR file. It'll pull in your Ruby dependencies, it'll pull in JRuby itself and any Java libraries you need, and it will produce a WAR file. And it'll actually produce a WAR file that is also executable like an executable jar. So if you just want to distribute this WAR file to production, run java-jar myapp.war, you've got an a running application with its own built-in server. Maybe that's even just Torquebox. But very easy to get a little service up and going, writing about 10 lines of code. Um, so the, the combined example that I wanted to show before we close out here, uh, Joe, uh, who did the Deploying JRuby book, is going to do the talk tomorrow on web frameworks, uh, has a little example of JRuby using asynchronous servlet APIs in servlet 3.1. Uh, and this combines Sinatra and Warbler and some Maven stuff and the servlet APIs. And it's just a handful of files. And I'll, I'll walk you through what they look like here. So here's our gem file for this application. Uh, again, pulling from rubygems.org. There's some of that logic saying we want Ruby 2.2.2 uh, compatibility. Uh, we want to use JRuby version 1.7.18 or higher. Uh, there we say we've, we're going to use Rack, because that's our standard servlet API. We're going to use Sinatra. Uh, and then if we're in the development environment, we're going to use Warbler to build WAR files. Here's our config RU, a little bit larger than the other examples, but we've got our require of Sinatra. We're creating an actual Sinatra application class here. Uh, and then for get slash, uh, we're going to say that we've got a chunked, trunked uh, uh, response coming back to the user. 
Uh, we're going to set, start the async logic in the servlet request. So it knows that we're going to be doing asynchronous responses here. And then we start up our thread that's actually going to do all that asynchronous work. And of course, you could pass this off to a thread pool or some other worker. Uh, this is just a simple example. Uh, it's going to sleep for 10 seconds each time. And then into that asynchronous response, it's going to print out some asynchronous information. Uh, and then tell the async that it's done with that iteration so it can push it out to the client. And then th down at the bottom, we'll complete this whole request by doing some synchronous HTML return. And of course, there's various frameworks for doing uh, HTML uh, templating and whatnot. Uh, and this is, this is largely the entire application. We've got our asynchronous application using some of the newer servlet features, but based on Sinatra as the web framework and JRuby as the platform. Uh, the pom.rb for this, uh, he actually just has a pom XML in the project, but I threw it into the uh, generator, and this is what came out. A uh, very simple set of, I mean, very little for dependencies. Uh, and this is actually using the Heroku plugin uh, to prepare it for deployment to Heroku. So all you need is to have this, get your Heroku account, you've got your microservice up and running in production. Uh, here we bundle install, it pulls in the libraries that we need, bundle exec warble to turn it into a war file. Uh, and in this case, we're just going to run it. Now we have a server up and going with our asynchronous server example. No deployment to a server. Uh, no additional dependencies that we have to worry about. Really pretty cool that it all comes together so nicely. Uh, so I'll summarize a little bit here. So I really want folks to think about JRuby as not just being Ruby. It's Ruby and Java. We've got the entire Java ecosystem. We leverage the JVM very well. Uh, and any Java stuff that you're using or you're used to, you can pull into Ruby stuff, Ru into Ruby applications. Uh, hopefully, this has shown that Ruby folks also have a lot of really cool things. Sinatra is a nice little Ruby micro framework, microservice. Uh, of course, Java is evolving fast too. But this all can tie together, and you don't have to choose one world or the other. You can use bits and pieces from both and integrate them really nicely with JRuby. Um, it's pretty easy to get this stuff started. Uh, like I showed, you have a Windows installer. There's Ruby installers that will pull down JRuby for you. You can unpack it and just run bin JRuby, and you're up and going. Uh, and all the libraries are out there. Uh, it's very easy to start playing with it. Uh, and it's pretty fun, and it's pretty powerful. Hopefully, you'll be able to play with it, get, get more familiar with libraries, uh, and try out some uh, Ruby scripting of Java or some of these frameworks. Uh, the final uh, slide here, these books are out there in the wild, but I think they've gone out of print. Uh, Joe's going to be working on an updated version of deploying JRuby in the next year. Uh, we're hoping to also do an updated version of using JRuby that includes JRuby 9000 and all of the recent advances like Sinatra and uh, uh, new performance improvements we've made. Uh, and that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody have questions? I've got about nine minutes for questions on this stuff. Yes, right over here. Right, so the question is about uh, some of the high profile migrations away from Ruby that have happened over the years. Obviously, one of the big ones that comes up is Twitter. Um, Puppet migrated some of their stuff over. Although I believe Puppet actually, for the server side stuff, uh, they actually moved to JRuby to address some of the, the issues with Ruby performance. Uh, so there are a number of people uh, that have done that. Uh, the question, though, was does JRuby uh, kind of stem some of that bleeding of, of projects that leave the Ruby community and address some of those issues? And, and the answer is yes, it absolutely does. Uh, most of the folks that were on that slide showing JRuby users have come to JRuby from standard Ruby uh, and are much happier with it now because the performance works, because they have true concurrency and a real G, a really solid garbage collector. Uh, the time frame for a lot of those big migrations, like Twitter, which was 
you know, in 2007, 2008 or so. Honestly, at that point, JRuby just wasn't ready. Uh, and they might have looked at JRuby, they might have not, but at that point, we weren't where we are now. Uh, to these days, JRuby itself should almost always be faster than regular C Ruby. Um, for simple things, maybe two to three times faster. For more complex applications, five to ten times faster than running the standard C implementation. And it does get well into the neighborhood of the regular Java web frameworks at that point. Uh, we've also got a lot of work coming in with Invoke Dynamic, with JRuby 9000, we're doing some more optimizations. Uh, and probably the biggest thing is a lot of folks migrated away from Ruby because it can't do concurrent threading. Uh, so you want to scale something out, you need to have uh, a process per user, essentially. So Twitter, obviously, is a perfect example of that. How do you scale out with thousands of users when you can only run one thread at a time? Uh, that's the sort of things that are driving people towards JRuby. They can throw it on JRuby application, take advantage of everything the JVM has to offer. Uh, and more and more, that's where we're seeing people going. Groupon is a good example of uh, an application that they, it's largely Ruby-based, uh, but couldn't make things scale, and now I understand that they're running a lot of it on JRuby to make up for the lost time there. Yeah, right here. Uh, how do you deal with these issues of uh, multi-threading, then you have to do things like synchronize, and uh, Ruby language doesn't support these uh, features as Java does. How do you deal with that? Right. So how do you deal with uh, some of the, the complexities of threading, like synchronization and uh, thread-safe data structures and so on, uh, from a, a language like Ruby that never had any of that? Uh, well, there's actually a project in the Ruby community called Concurrent Ruby. Uh, it's done right now as just an, uh, an, a library that you can depend on. Uh, but it essentially includes all of what's in Java Util Concurrent, uh, all of what you see in something like Clojure. There's all implementations that are built to work across Ruby implementations. So they work in C Ruby, they work in JRuby, but they provide atomic variables. They provide uh, thread pools. They provide executors. Uh, all of this stuff is being done as a, as a excellent project in the Ruby community to basically build up those pieces that are missing from Ruby's concurrency story. At the same time, uh, I'm a Ruby core committer for the standard implementation. I work with uh, the Ruby core folks, Yukihiro Matsumoto, Koichi, the core guys that work on Ruby. Uh, and we are, in future versions of Ruby, going to improve that concurrency story, add some more of those features like volatility for variables and final variables and so on. Things that, that we've come to depend on in Java are getting into Ruby as a language, but are also available today as a library that you can pull in. So this, this, the concurrency story used to be not great. Um, JRuby was the only story in town, and we had to kind of make it work. But the rest of the Ruby community is caught up now, and they're doing a lot of great work in that area. Yes, up here. Can I have a polyglot project like create a Java cluster and also Ruby code to run Rails application? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there, the, like the standard rake build tool, there are some plugins to do Java builds for it as well. Um, so if you're comfortable with Rake and working in a Ruby environment, it's very easy to have it also build your Java libraries and put them in the right places for Rails. Uh, but you can also, there are Maven plugins and Gradle plugins that go along with JRuby that then also know about the Ruby side, know about the Java side, pull dependencies from both and build it as a single application. Uh, so that stuff is all out there. Depending on which build tool you use, it'll vary a little bit. And there are a lot of mixed projects out there, definitely. So, so it's like a good idea to write your basic code in Java for type safety and all this uh, front end stuff to, to write in Ruby code. Right, right. So the, the comment is, uh, it may, is it a good idea to kind of write your business logic or your core logic in Java and then write some of the, the web stuff in Ruby? Um, that's, that's what we've seen as a, a really good fit. The application side, the, the front end side that changes and is really dynamic and needs to respond to new user requests and new features, that's a great place to do Ruby and Rails. Um, use Ruby for what it's really good at, fast iterating code, uh, easy stuff to change, make changes quickly. Write your core stuff in uh, a Java or a Clojure or a Scala in the back end somewhere. That can do some of the heavy lifting, that can be used as a, a service behind your Rails applications. Um, I think I've heard the term uh, reverse mullet application. It's uh, party in the front and business in the back. Other questions? Don't think I see any, so we'll, uh, we'll call it there. Thanks very much.